Okay, we're live, live streaming. I'm going to spotlight you, John. Okay. Good evening, and thank you for joining us at uh, the Writers Guild of Bloomington. This is our first Wednesday spoken word series, and this is a special one because it is as uh, long-term members know, we usually go kind of dark in September because we do the spoken word stage for the Fourth Street Fair. And uh, since we're there for two days intensely reading, we don't do a first Wednesday, but this year, um, Fourth Street doesn't have a spoken word stage. So this is our spoken, this is our Fourth Street special extravaganza first Wednesday spoken word series. And please do go to the Fourth Street Fair to, um, to visit our poets who will be doing poetry on demand as they usually do at our usual spot at uh, Fourth and Dunn, right by, um, right by uh, Siam House. So this is sponsored in part by the Indiana Arts Commission, the Bloomington Arts Commission, and the Bloomington Urban Enterprise Association. The Writers Guild of Bloomington wishes to acknowledge and honor the indigenous communities, na communities native to this region and recognize that Indiana University and the city of Bloomington were built on indigenous homelands and resources. We recognize the Miami, Delaware, Potawatomi, and Shawnee people as past, present, and future caretakers of this land. Uh, the Writers Guild has a number of events coming up and they are, we have an ongoing online presence for third, what we call Third Sunday Write. Uh, it's a virtual place to find writing prompts and the company of other writers. Uh, members visit the private Facebook page to respond to prompts that are posted monthly. Uh, you can write and post anytime during the month and offer a response to others writing by sharing a readback line, a line from their piece in the comments. Um, so for more information or to join the group, please contact Shauna Ritter at Shauna, S-H-A-N-A, 747 at gmail.com. And please include Third Sunday in your subject line. And I will put that in the chat. Uh, the Fourth Street Festival, as I have said, is happening this, this weekend, uh, Labor Day weekend, and Poetry on Demand will be sponsored by the Writers Guild of Bloomington uh, Saturday and Sunday at the uh, intersection of Fourth and Dunn, and it's uh, 10 to 6 on Saturday and 10 to 5 on Sunday, and so you go, you pay a poet, and you get a poem, and it can be on anything you like, so it's it, such a deal and the holidays are coming. So please visit us. We will have our monthly business meeting via Zoom on uh, Saturday, September 18th at 3 p.m. And uh, if you wish to participate in that business meeting, just drop me a line or Tony Brewer or Kyle Cross a line and we will send you the Zoom link. And finally, uh, last Sunday poetry and open mic I'm, I'm actually a little confused by the, by the listing. It says, it's Sunday, September 26th, and it says 3 p.m. via Zoom, but it also says live and in person with uh, guest posts Josh Brewer and Patsy Ron, followed by an open mic. The in-person part will be at the Monroe, Monroe County Convention Center, 302 South College in the Hanson Room. There's parking in the back and it's free and the entrance is also in the back. And I will try to, to straighten this out. And in the newsletter, I will um, give you the skinny on what's actually happening with uh, last Sunday poetry reading and open mic. Uh, if you would like to join the Writers Guild or if you would simply like to uh, subscribe to the newsletter, you can do it by going to our website, writersguildbloomington.com, writersguildbloomington, all one word, dot com. And all the information that I've just given you is also available on our website. And uh, we would also appreciate it if you would like us on Twitter, Instagram, and or Facebook. Uh, so tonight, we have a wonderful lineup. 
Uh, and I put the running order in chat so you can kind of keep track. Uh, Hannah Marks is our musician and she will be starting us out for about with about 10 minutes. And then uh, Joseph, Eric and Tony will be reading uh, poems seven minutes each. Hannah will come back for 15 minutes. Eric, Tony and Joseph will do another set seven minutes each. And then they will conclude with a poem each and Hannah will take us out. So I will introduce people in the order in which they're appearing. And once again, just thank you so much for coming. And uh, we've been doing this for a while now. And, um, and it's just, it's, I feel like a very nice community is building. So Hannah Marks is a bassist, band leader, composer, and educator living in New York City. She's performed at the Detroit Jazz Festival, Hyde Park Jazz Festival, Iowa City Jazz Festival, and Indie Jazz Fest. Her current project, Tide Pools, is a trio with alto saxophonist Alfredo Connor and drummer Connor Parks. Her former project, Heartland Trio, released their debut album in November 2018. Uh, Marx is currently an artist in residence at Old Greenwich Presbyterian Church in New Jersey and a curator for Green Lung Studio in Brooklyn. And her website, which I'll also put in chat, is um, http tps uh, colon slash slash www.hannamarksbase, all one word, dot com. And also, I would like to say that on October 13th, she's going to be at the Black House for uh, the Wednesday Jazz Fest. So please join me in welcoming Hannah to uh, Bloomington. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. This one of the one of those times when I really wish we could be in a room together because I'm sure the vibrations would be wonderful. So our first uh, reader tonight, our first poet, is Joseph Fulkerson, who runs Laughing Ronan Press and is the author of seven books. His most recent, Snout Chasing Tail, was published by Laughing Ronan Press. He lives and works in the bourbon-soaked hills of Western Kentucky. And um, Joseph, if you have a website that you prefer people to use, maybe after you read, you could put that in the chat. Please join me in welcoming Joseph. Hello, can you hear me okay? All right. First one I'm gonna read is uh, off of my collection, the Glenmore Sessions, it's called 21 Grams. Lately, I've been thinking about my own mortality and just how fragile life can be. They claim that at the time of death, when your soul leaves your body, you lose 21 grams of weight. If we're counting, that's eight pennies or 15 paper clips, if you will. That's 19 jelly beans. Better yet, 100 raindrops on a chilly autumn morning. It troubles me to think that everything that makes us unique carries so little weight. It seems so insignificant. When I die, I want the sun to supernova and the earth to spin off its axis. I want the oceans to be at rest so the tide never comes back in. When I leave this earth, I want people to wonder how they could ever go on in my absence. 21 grams isn't enough. My soul feels so much heavier than that. Thank you. I'm going to read a few out of uh, the collection, uh, the Glenmore Sessions. This next one is titled uh, The Curmudgeon. <clears throat> I'm not satisfied unless it's raining. I'm talking torrential downpour, broken levee kind of rain. I'm not happy until the verdict is in. Capital murder in the first, no possibility of parole. I'm not worried until the market has crashed, the bubble has burst wide, and the bottom has fallen out of it all. I'm unable to empathize with angry crowds gathered to protest my right to use the family bathroom at Target alone. I won't be swayed by your ability to conjugate full sentences, and I am unavailable for comment. Next one is titled after the, uh, the title of the, the collection, the Glenmore Sessions. All my friends reside within the urban jungle of my mind, the deep thinker, the free spirit, the thrifty penny salesman, the college professor, professing his love for all things Tarantino. Imagine me in a world that can't exist without you in it. And that would come close to explaining how I, to explaining how I feel about winter time. The time between sunrise and sunset is squandered away most days on work and regret. I want to dive headlong into the oceans that lie within your beautiful blue eyes. If I drown, it will have been for a good cause. If I live, it'll be on my own terms. Thank you. All right, we're gonna switch over to my second collection, which is 3 a.m. blues. I'll read a couple out of it as long as I have enough time here. This one's called Coagulated. It's surprising the things you find out about yourself at three o'clock in the morning, lying on the living room floor, head spinning with drink, mind racing with regret, wanting so desperately to send that message yet knowing it's inviting the devil back in, granting the succubus access to my vital organs once more. Like the drag of the needle tracing silhouettes of angels, wings down my arm, veins clouding with the junk of us. Thank you. 
I'm sure we've all been there. This next one is called more. Are we ever really happy? That gnawing, clawing, insatiable, teeth gnashing feeling that there's more, more to experience, more to explore, to love, to screw up, to lose. The feeling you're just scratching the surface of life, that there's not enough hours, minutes, or seconds in the day to discover, pursue, and accomplish those things that were strategically placed just out of our reach in the deepest recesses of our soul, inex inexplicably linked to the very fabric of who we are. There's always more. There has to be. All right. How am I doing on time here? I'm doing all right. Yeah, I think you've got time for one more. Okay. I've got time for one more. This one's, uh, this one's called, it's out of the 3 a.m. blues again. Uh, this one's called, I Used to Want to Sail the World. And this collection was uh, really a meditation on some relationships that I've had and, uh, you know, kind of my progression and my growth through those times. So this may resonate with someone. It doesn't necessarily resonate with me as much now, but it was good to get it out there. In, into the stratosphere. So this one's called, I used to want to sail the world. I used to want to sail the world. Now it hurts to say your name aloud. We swore we would tell each other when we fell out of love that we wouldn't waste one another's time, but it came suddenly and without warning. I can count on one hand, maybe two, the times I dialed your number thinking just a whisper is all I needed. Just one word followed by silence. Star 69 and the imagined shock of realization across your face. That's enough excitement for tonight. When you walk away from eternity, does that exempt you from heaven and hell? I just need to know if it's too late to hedge my bets. I hear reincarnation is nice. I could come back as a raven or maybe a silkworm and weave my failures into a nice sized duvet. I used to want to sail the world but now I can't be in the same room as you without losing the ability to conjugate vows. It was always vows with us, our, our, our arguments always ending in IOU. Not to say the times in between weren't the best we ever had, just that the edges were sharp and the cuts were deep. I used to want to sail the world. Nowadays, I just want to right the ship, keep, keep it safely tucked into the harbor and moored to the shore far from the uncertainties of what lie beneath the surface of the deep. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Those were, um, those were wonderful, really wonderful. And um, so we'll be having another, Joseph will be coming back for the next set. Uh, next up, we have Eric Rensberger who is a long-term member of the Bloomington poetry scene. He's published several chapbooks and has been published in magazines and journals, as well as unconventional formats. He constantly works on a theoretically endless project, account of my days. I have visions of him just trolling away. Um, he has hopes for the future, good. And uh, there is more at www.ericrensbergerpoetry, all one word, dot net, and I will put that in chat. Please join me in welcoming our very own Eric Rensberger. Hi there. Uh, good to be here. Uh, glad to be uh, sharing this uh, reading with Joseph and Tony, and I'm really loving uh, Hannah's music. Uh, and I want to do a little shout out before I begin to uh, Joan and Kyle for writing Heard on this, this whole event. So the stuff I'm going to read tonight, the first set is stuff I've written in the last uh, couple of months. Uh, and then in the second set, I'm going to uh, read stuff that I've written uh, earlier in the year and uh, from last year. So the theme for the evening is, for me is going to be uh, the uh, COVID episode of our shared history. Uh, and that's going to be kind of a background noise uh, to all of the poems. Sometimes it will 
be referenced a little more directly. Other times it will be sort of a distant echo. But uh, I just wanted to say that's kind of going to be a theme running throughout. I'm going to start out with two tiny little poems. Uh, the first one is almost not a poem. It's just an image that popped into my head at a certain point. While washing my hands, I thought, fingers are water too, even the bones. Outlets of great rivers sometimes spread many courses plunging into salt water. Elegy number blank. After a life is gone, has been done, inside each second is something of him waiting for us, like a face you almost see in a drop of water. So tiny a thing to leave behind, he won't even miss it. Um, this next one is uh, a prose poem, a little paragraph. A deity, the god of disappearances, worshipped in an enormous room stacked with stuff, where people filing through the mounds find poets living on grants given to enumerate all the things deposited there. There is so much of it that no one thing can be proved to be gone. It could always be at the bottom of the next pile or on top of that heap. It's as though everything that comes here has disappeared because it can't be found in all the clutter, but also exists forever, for it cannot be shown to be lost. And in the murmur of poets' prayers, all the enumerations sound like elegies. So um, in the past year and a half, uh, uh, I have, and I'm sure this is true of many of you too, experienced a lot of solitude. Uh, I'm somebody who likes solitude. I even kind of need it. But I've certainly had a belly full of it uh, the last year and a half. And just when you're kind of reaching a moment like that, sometimes you do something almost accidental and kind of simple, like you just step outside your front door and stand on the porch for a minute at dusk, and you look out and you realize, well, you know, kind of the world is still here with me in some fashion or other. Off and on. That one firefly who from here seems to have the whole night behind him for contrast lights up his corner in that low spot where the woods cover starts to get truly deep. He could also be said to have the whole night before him. He'll be up later than me. My head will come to rest and turn itself off, but his little light will go on again after it goes off, and then go off again, and then on, and keep this up late into the night and high into the trees. Uh, so I'm going to close shudders thinking its turn is next. Like the sunset falling into its bed of roses would be the last one to get noticed. And the next morning wouldn't be morning without all the fuss made about it. And even we ourselves who always think, oh, we'll last that long or longer would think instead, hey, we're not mortal or immortal, only optional. Thing before. Once again, I'm watching the sunset. Once again, I'm preparing to leave. I'm listening to what others say one more time. I'm making my lists like I do. I comfort myself 
by telling myself, been through it before, in answer to the other stuff I keep telling myself. Near at hand, where I made sure they'd be, are the sausages I bought at the store that might close. You need sausages sometimes, like noodles or rice or fresh greens. I'm not worried about the store. I've heard rumors like that and then a denial and then more rumors, more denials. Everything's repeating. Nothing is over. That's another thing I tell myself in answer to the thing before it. Thank you. Those were great. I love those images. So our, um, our third poet tonight is Tony Brewer, who is the co-coordinator of this series with me. Um, his latest book is The History of Projectiles, which is out from Alien Buddha Press. Other titles include Homunculus and Hot Type Cold Read. He's president of the National Audio Theater Festivals and frequently collaborates with Urban Deer Record Company. He has written hundreds of poems on demand over the past decade for, pa for patrons at live events, including this weekend at the 4th Street uh, Festival in Bloomington. And there's more at his blog spot, and I will put that up in the chat. It's uh, tonybrewer71.blogspot.com. He's also the past president and current treasurer of the Writers Guild at Bloomington. He's my co-conspirator on many projects, and he writes the checks. Please join me in welcoming Tony Brewer. I sign him too. <laughs> <laughs> it's called Signatory Power. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, good to see Eric. Good to see Joseph. Good to see Hannah. Good to see all you folks. <clears throat> Hiromi, we'll see you when you get a new laptop next month. Uh, actually, I'll see you this weekend. I'll see you at 4th Street. So um, I'm going to read um, a few things tonight that are interesting chronologically. Um, I did a lot of writing during uh, this past year during lockdown. And I kind of turned, since I couldn't really do a lot of, um, couldn't do very much reading, I turned toward um, focusing on my backlog and getting stuff out and trying to get stuff published. And I've had some success there, I actually published the book during lockdown that I'd been working on for two or three years. That's the, the History of Projectiles book. And I'll, I'll get to that uh, here in a little bit. <clears throat> but I actually published some things that are like 10 years old that just never found a home for, which is kind of cool, as well as some things that were written um, during the early days of lockdown. And that's what I'm going to start off with. This is, yes, it's a reading. <laughs> We're going to start with, uh, this is called The Bottle in the Cosmic Ocean. Here. 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 Here we go. This will help. My emotional, emotional support cat. The Bottle in the Cosmic Ocean. In our vast language of signs, Hoary old saws lost in translation rattle around the deep edges of the heliosphere. Naked, waving hello, goodbye, commentary on wildflowers, snatches of Bach and Chuck Berry. Miraculously, it's intentionless bird song the needle drops on first, scratching over bloviating human highs from stern heads of state. Emissaries operating at odd frequencies, the birds make sense, and the listener focused on the far flung message buried deep on side two. We adapted to this, whether we survived or not, is what they say between sweetness sung so hard it sounds like a worried come on to ears that parse the further warning. They are coming, working playing, laughing, crying, millennia from now, still talking, telling everything about themselves in long waves of endless celestial static. Will the intelligence we hope to reach 
already know our deepest fears, the loneliness of a planet teeming with life we barely understand? Will they tolerate us politely? Or will they turn out the light and hope we go another way? Uh, so that was, uh, I was doing some checking last night. That's, that was written on April 30th of last year. I do, uh, I like to do 30 and 30 where I write a poem a day for the month, excuse me, <clears throat> from the month of April. And that was the last one. So it was pretty, pretty cheery mood in the tree fort last year around the end of April. Um, this one, um, this just got published in a, uh, um, let's see, it's called uh, Alien Buddha Goes Pop. It's a special uh, pop culture uh, issue put out by Alien Buddha Press. And um, I'm thrilled that they took it because this is one that's 10 years old and um, it's a Sestina. You may have seen me post about this thing. I actually got a damn Sestina. In 2021, I got a Sestina published in a pop culture um, magazine journal. So um, we'll see. I mean, it's 10 years old, so maybe it's a little moldy, but we'll go with it anyway. <clears throat> this is called, um, and Sestinas are kind of long. So, I mean, they're not like super, they're not like epics, but. So this is, uh, this is called Dorothy, We're Not Listening to Kansas Anymore. And Dor Dorothy is Dorothy Parker, which you might, you might pick up on. Maybe not. I don't know. Dorothy, we are not listening to Kansas anymore. Life is a glorious cycle of song. Sorry if you don't get the joke. Singing fans your little hurts, but only when you know the words. Otherwise, you might find you can keep time, but after a while, your brain gets bored with all that rickety racket bored pretending you love this song smiling and nodding and tapping in time that's when concerts turn into a big joke i like readings better i like words but i like hearing too sometimes listening hurts sticks and the stones can wound and hurt with their volume and chords but i get bored listening to bands musicalize empty words and render cliches rocked into song it's all one big, long, unbroken, rhythmic joke, as if we, the audience, have all the time in the world, yet we have no time. I can say from experience, it never hurts to listen to a badly told joke, as long as you don't look bored. It's like someone else's favorite song you don't like. You learn the words to make them happy, but alone, the words are actually pretty lame especially times when they're just sing, sing, singing that song, but they really can't sing and you don't want to hurt their feelings, but you are bored and inwardly laugh thinking, what a joke. Conversely, try telling your own joke. Make up and write and rewrite your words the next time you're at a reading, bored, or are draped on the railing at a concert, killing time you'll never get back, looking cool and hurt and obviously so like over this song but if everyone is bored from just your telling the joke and you can't read music but you know the words you're wasting your time writing laughter try hurt <clears throat> and then um <clears throat> For my last one for this first little setlet, um, I'm going to do some. Um, I'm going to read some poems on demand that I have written uh, over the past eleven years that I've been doing poetry on demand at various events and whatnot. And um, eventually, they're going to go into a book. I mean, they kind of are going into a book, but eventually, I'm going to find a publisher for them. So, um, and, uh, you know, the problem is the format of the book. Like, do I put in all the stories that go along with the poems or do I let the poem just kind of like stand on their own? Um, so I don't know. That's that's one of the that's one of the stoppers for me is kind of figuring out that format. But um, this one, I'll go ahead and tell you, because I wrote this for Kyle. 
Um, this is from uh, June 22nd, 2019, pre-COVID days. Uh, this is from the Arts Fair on the Square, June 22nd, 2019. And if I remember correctly, the prompt was something about, um, I, think, I think the prompt was exactly killing your inner editor. I think that's what the prompt was, excuse me. So these are very short. So this is, a, okay, yeah, right. This is very short. Uh, these tend to be very short. They tend to be like 20, 20 to 25 lines, somewhere in that vicinity. So here we go. This will be my last one for the set list, set lit. Uh, this is called Slayer. Inner critic. Yeah, it's right. Inner critic. Yeah, your inner critic. Silencing, killing your inner critic, I think. There's definitely violence involved. Uh, <clears throat> so this is called Slayer. Make a machete of your palm and wield it with a fleshy chop. Aim for the jugular of meaning, the unprotected neck of reason. For the corpus of the critic has many tools, many weapons, and endless failure vessels of spite. Who's going to carry your water now? You, thirsty? Thirsty drought into flashy flood, into the ground where he buried half a dozen saints, remembering each can't and ain't. It's all the same funeral man, preacher, griever, bearer, digger. Be the swinging of the blade. Say yes and to the spark. Let mealy mouth Charon take tuppence for someone else's eyes. Keep yours open in the dark. Thanks. Yeah, I wish everybody could have heard this. We we joke often that the kind of low level soundtrack for readings are people going mmm or ooh, and I wish you could have all heard the mmms and oops as you were reading. So we're going to come back to Hana now for a, a 15 minute set, and then we'll come back again to our poets. Thank you, that was beautiful. Um, I'm going to play, or at least start with, uh, a piece by Ornette Coleman. This is a blues entitled Turnaround.
Thank you. That was um, uh, Paul Motion's song entitled By a Blue. That was fantastic. Um, I hope that all the, per the performers and readers are, are seeing the chat comments because people are writing very nice things about your work. So for this set, we are going to have um, Eric, Tony, and Joseph each going for seven minutes each. So we'll start with Eric. Hi there. Hi. Um, so this set uh, will be stuff from last year and earlier uh, in this year. Uh, and there was a uh, a point in time uh, last year when I sort of came to me, holy cow, this thing could go on for a very, very long time. And the image that came to mind was somebody trying to swim across the lake and getting about to the middle of it. So uh, this is a little prose poem. It feels like this, midpoint, help equidistant in all directions impossible to stay here unknown if help can be reached 
forget the distant help. Just worry about the next few yards. Try to ignore the panic. It doesn't help to hum, but sometimes one says one's thoughts aloud. Words going on from midpoint with you. Soothing companions. Only if you arrive will they arrive too. Jackknife. Found you again in the dirt by the tool shed, rusted, ruined. Couldn't bear to throw you away. You were no longer just the old jackknife, having become a small but significant sculpture. You embody time and all its damage. No blade so sharp it can be threatened away, no case hard enough to keep it out. Even steel fails. Set in your new place, you can be seen every day. Your mud and rust are signs of the dignity of survival, signs of the impossibility of survival. The lost year isn't any bigger, actually, than a lost minute. Once lost, they're all the same. And it isn't any smaller, either, than the lost decade, the lost century, lost millennium. Once lost, there's no dimension to them. Comparisons no longer work. And when we pass that boundary beyond which all time and everything in it has gone, then all is the same, eternal equality of the lost. So uh, it's easy to forget in the midst of all the other stuff going on that last year we actually had a bit of a drought here regionally uh, that went on from, you know, end of July, beginning of August until the rains finally came in the fall. And it wasn't like the, uh, you know, really kind of terrible stuff they've been having out west, but it was a noticeable event here uh, regionally. So um, the date or the title of this is a date given in numerals, 10, 26, 20. After the rainy days finally come, the ground fills, it gets heavier and stops looking like dust. The news is bad and relentless as rain. I fill with anxiety. My mind feels heavier. My body is clumsy. When I talk to myself to explain away the fear or plan how to live with it, my speech is slow and hesitating. It keeps on raining. I fear the future. There must be a way to understand things that would soothe me, but if words were all it took to understand, I would have stopped trying by now. Life well lived. Make a world, lose a world. And again, make a world, lose a world. That's your life child's world made and lost youth's world made and lost old one to whom loss is familiar they say you only live once but you lose many times so i'm gonna uh close my set with this one and i just I uh, want to make a uh, note of this. I actually have read this in this series before, but it's hopefully it's been long enough ago that it will pass because it was in May of 2020. And I think uh, Tony can, uh, or Joan or somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was, uh, it was either the first or the second of the uh, virtual episodes of this series. Uh, last year. Anyways, this was uh, 
written, so in early 2020, uh, when this whole thing had just kind of erupted and we were still trying to get our bearings and figure out what was going on. And we had been given these strange new guidelines for life. You, you know, wear a mask when you go out in public, uh, wash your hands frequently, don't touch your face, uh, and keep your distance from everybody. What we know now, we know how dangerous we are to each other, how we need each other. We know, as we didn't know before, how much we live in our hands, how we make our place in the world with them, how we need and touch and need and touch. Now we can't stop thinking about our hands. Now the things we've said with them are new again. For instance, give me a hand, or living hand to mouth. We now know that when we are forbidden to touch our faces, our faces come alive with a longing for our hands, an unbearable itch only fingers can ease. And we know now, as we know our own hands, who it is that is most necessary to us. And we know a new meaning of far away that is only a different way of saying apart. And in that longing for the necessary one, we know each other. We know the distraught distance each feels. We know how we need each other. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. I, I remember that poem and I really love it. So I was happy to hear it again. So the, um, our third reader in this set is Joseph Wilkerson, who, um, yes, who can chime in. I think we skipped Tony. Did, oh, I'm so sorry. We did indeed. Tony, I'm so sorry. I was so mesmerized by Eric's poems that I was racing toward the end. So next up, we have Tony Brewer, who will forgive me, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I honestly wasn't quite sure of the order myself. So, um, so a district supervisor here in-house tells me I need to talk less and read more So if I'm going to make it through these three uh, hopefully four poems. So uh, I'm going to read something from uh, the new chapbook, History of Projectiles. I'm going to read the uh, the final section, and we'll see how these stand on their own. The whole thing kind of hangs together uh, in a single thing, but I'm going to try reading this final section and see how it goes. Uh, this is called Culture. Hunting with dad means being the dog flushing rabbits from winter thickets. Up and out early before Christmas dinner at grandma's, candy lucky strikes in my stocking. The car window cracked for his ashes and the back seat dusted. It is just nonstop action around here. I'm almost done. In my active shooter training, there are no guns. You, squealing in your stall, a carpeted cube, but whatever. When the wolves come, and he is always coming, run and hide, little lamb, run hide. I'd put at least a building between me and the building invaded, or read minds and take a mental health day. Now we all know how to carry like that high school kid with an endless arsenal he pulls out of his baggy pants. The naming of victims automatic as the silence and the bells. Turn off all devices and tweet later when you're safe. If you must fight, commit to action. Improvise weapons, overwhelm with numbers, stats and graphs if you can read them. He doesn't teach the fear and touch of trigger and elation. He is coming for the children who instinctively barricade or train them. Problems 
stuffed in unattended backpacks. The knob turns left and right, behind which are solutions born of problems born into. I rest my hand over rifle muzzle. Dad says, don't do that, and so I don't. The murder down the road remains unsolved. You don't need a shotgun you can't lift, so handgun then is all the training mom gets and how I ended up with it. Uh, I want to read something that Joseph Fulkerson published in uh, his, the inaugural um, issue of uh, Seppuku Quarterly um, that seems kind of fitting. Uh, given the last piece, um, this is called Classic. Classic. Every film and cartoon I watched as a kid too young to get into the theater alone was heavily edited for network television. The ceaseless blasting of Daffy Duck's face off remained, but the bull never exploded. The suicide bear only aired once that I saw. All the light TNA commercial broken and cussing badly dubbed because you couldn't say fuck and six other things. Sex was always off screen. Phoebe Cates out of the pool never happened from the neck down. James Bond was merely salacious like Pepe Le Pew. The girl in the after-school special who had sex for money learned a valuable lesson and went home, unlike rings busted on the news. Even the omen on Sunday night left the unavoidable train sandwich to the imagination, frames excised to fit the prime time slot. Layers of mediated experience flayed apart by letterbox director's cuts smearing screens and undiluted gore when I thought I had seen it all. Taxi driver, 4 p.m. on Saturday afternoon, minus the slow dance with her pimp. Apocalypse Now, whittled down to two and a half hours. Warner Brothers witch doctors with nose bones stayed, but enough violence cut to make Bugs Bunny less cruel or cool. My imagination, <clears throat> excuse me, my imagination was rated R, protected from the unreality of art, while the news filled the margins with a curated narrative and enough space for a word from our sponsors. I'm going to read something brand spanking new. Uh, that may show up in another form later this month. In fact, it will show up in a later form. Um, um, you will you will hear more about this later. Uh, but this is a this is called the power in the blood. We knew Uncle Ivan had diminished, though he was still mowing his yard in May like the old men do around here. He got worse, and then he was gone. The pastor opens Ivan's Bible, and bookmarks fall out, and post-its and dog-eared pages tell him where to start and how to finish the service. I cannot keep straight who hugs and who shakes hands, make awkward A-frames with cousins who don't, and get pulled into ants who do. We try to prefer to stay at arm's length behind masks, find ourselves drawn in and caught up. We all have farmer eyes, downturned, an inner weariness and wrinkly from sun. Look like we've been crying. Comfort in the quiet of a field adjoining this manicured cemetery. A silence everyone agrees on, except Somewhere drones a tractor and wind rustles tall drying corn. 
He's going home, the pastor says, as the song kicks in. Precious memories, how they linger, how they ever flood my soul. In the stillness of the midnight, precious sacred scenes unfold. It's hard nowadays not to be from the internet and its eternal September of 1993. But I am from a place with a name, tiny and completely mapped the same way Capricorns come from a specific moment in space-time where everything stopped when stars aligned along trajectories and atoms coalesced into me were conjured. Every time I visit that little town, its amber grows a little thicker, home less complicated than a world bumping up against everyone's large concern. Most roads around here I know like the back of my hand, I needed GPS to find this cemetery. That's how far away I live and how long since I've been back. My kin are missing fingers lost to the plow and long buried. I miss the sanctuary of this land as I steady myself reaching out into largely empty air. No music at all, except the hum and whir of honest machines and the grace of being landlocked and broken by only so many precious years. And one more, I want to do, uh, this is another short one. This is another uh, short poem on demand. This is all kind of a, a prelude to uh, some of the work I will be doing this weekend, hopefully. Um, this is actually a mail-in for uh and i remember this was for my my dear friend jill kelly corin over there in madison indiana and this is from uh may 21st 2019 um and i believe she gave me the prompt at poet palooza there in madison indiana <clears throat> this is called the process there are problems all over the draft of ourselves, we share with a class taught by flaws, rewarded now and then with seeing them. Wait, let me begin again. Many decisions went into making this, sparked by ruddy impulse and a long hard think and a long hand thrust into the well. Let us then tear it apart together in a circle of hyenas, maybe more a quilting bee, each drop stitch where the worn needle is immune to callous tips, seemingly born to receive the thorn. Are we making a mess of lies? Or have we finally figured out the struggle did not start with a fist, a stumble into a sketch, a slip of paper, truth among wadded mistakes like snowballs hurled at trash? Some hit along trajectories, smack ahead like a kiss. We are loving where it lands. Thanks. Thank you. Those were wonderful. Really wonderful. Um, so the third poet in this uh, in this round is Joseph Wilkerson, who I was so anxious to get to early. So Joseph, please. Okay. So Joan, you'd asked about uh, a website. Um, I can I can put it in the comments or however I need to do it, but laughingronanpress.com. You can get a hold of me there. But yeah. Or I'm on social media, I'm on all the social medias and, and I usually post updates on what's going on. So if you like what I have and want to want to read more, you can find me on Laughing Ronin or uh, Facebook or, or Instagram. So I'm usually pretty active on those social media sites. That being said, I'm going to read one out of um, a chat book that um, Analog Submission Press put out early last year. Really good press for uh, chat books. Awesome, I highly recommend them. 
Uh, this one's called Steady As She Goes. Steady as she goes. Rise and shine, part your hair on the left. Make sure to brush and floss. No cavities will be tolerated. Don't want to get the dreaded gingivitis. Hide your tattoos, tuck in your shirt and stop slouching. Eat your greens, do your homework, pay your taxes, go to church. Get married and settle down. Your upside down mortgage notwithstanding. The kiddos will need a college fund. Don't forget, don't forget the employer matched 401k up to 6%. Embrace the two party system. Your choice is being either or. It's the same choice regardless. Death by a thousand cuts or a thousand little compromises. Don't rock the boat. Keep one foot in front of the other. Careful not to say anything too progressive, too conservative. Wouldn't want to make waves to cause anyone to feel uncomfortable. It would be a shame to tarnish your spotless record of having nothing to add, of never weighing in. Right down the middle, keep it between the lines. You can't hold an opinion so controversial as to upset the order of things. People may think you've gone and taken a side. You need to keep them guessing as to what you stand for, if anything at all. Once as a young boy, there were two girls, both named Sarah. They called me on the telephone, asking which I liked best. They told me I had to choose, make one girl happy, make one cry. I was damned either way. So I chose and have been choosing the wrong Sarah ever since. All right. So I do have a, a new collection out called Snout Chasing Tail. Cute little doggy on the front there. I'm going to read a couple out of it. I don't only publish my own stuff, if, if that's what you're asking. I wanted to uh, start and set a standard, I guess, uh, as to what I wanted to put out. And other people, if they liked it and liked the product that I put out, they would uh, follow suit. So I've got a lot of books coming out in the next six months. Uh, some pretty pretty big names that I'm proud to have that they submitted some manuscripts to me. So uh, I'm very excited for what's going on. But that being said, uh, I'm gonna read a couple out of Snout Chasing Tail. Luck favors the risk takers. Although I'll venture a guess, the corpse at the bottom of the chasm would disagree with that statement. This one's called wrong in all the right places. People claim they want honesty, but they're scared of the truth. They want advice without an opinion. They want their courage tested without the struggle associated with it. They want patience and they want it now. They want talent yet are unwilling to put in the work necessary to bring it forth. It hurts wrong in all the right places. Here's one, uh, it's a little longer. So I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna make this my last one. I'm not sure, I haven't been keeping track of time, but let's make this the last one for this round. So this one's called to my former self, excuse me, to my former self from a future iteration. And I don't think I've read this before. So bear with me if I make a couple of mistakes. You should write this down. Actually, you should write everything down all the time. On October 12th, 2022, at approximately 5.30 p.m., when you get to Jimmy John's, order the beach club instead of the Totally Tuna. You'll be glad you did. Don't stop by the bank to withdraw cash from the ATM. It will eat your card, forcing you to use your MasterCard the rest of the week. Instead of meeting your friend Matt to have a drink, stay home. If you absolutely insist on going out, don't stay out too late, 10.30, 11 p.m. at the latest. When you get to the pub, sit at the fifth bar stool from the door, the one directly. Resist looking into her hazel colored eyes. Try not to fall in love with the way she bites her bottom lip. 
while thinking of an, of an excuse to come back up to the bar. She'll find one and make her way back to where you sit. She will be everything we've been looking for, everything we need. We will fall in love with her instantly. We will propose quickly, get married quicker, and live a happy life for a long time. That is until the cancer takes her from us. It will be the hardest thing we will ever encounter. You will consider death to be easier, and I'm not so sure it isn't. I'm not sure it wasn't, isn't, which is the reason for this highly irregular correspondence. So do us both a favor. Don't go to karaoke night on Thursday, October 12, 2022. It's too much of a loss. Stay home and watch Broad City instead. This week's episode is quite funny. You will thank me later. Sincerely, future iteration of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. So for this last round, each poet is going to read one poem. And I'm going to put the order in the chat. It'll be Tony, Joseph, Eric. I think it'll be too disruptive if we keep coming back to me each time. So if you could just hand the baton off to one another, that would be great. So Tony, and then Joseph, and then Eric. Yes, unmute myself. What a great idea. Thanks, Zoom. So I'm actually going to break form. I'm going to do two because they're really short. I'm going to do two um, poems on demand. Um, and one's super, super short. So I'm going to do the sad one first. And then we'll end on a happy one. We'll end on a happy note. Won't that be happy? Um, <clears throat> so this first one uh, is super short. This is from uh, Art Fair, uh, excuse me, Affair of the Arts, August 10th, 2021. So not uh, very long ago. And um, I didn't actually do the interview on this one. I was just given the title. Um, she requested a poem on grief and she came and, and the title was that she came up with was Tea Party on Grief. I don't even know what the what the grief was about, but this is what I came up with. Tea Party on Grief. It steeps in the belly of the pot as it brews and stews, keeping you up or knocking you out, depending on what leaves. Some sadness has a limit who has a seat at table. Some leaves a whole life unstable, unable to see a whole life like a mask that cannot be removed, only grown accustomed to. Soaking into the psyche like rain seeps into skin, surviving but wet with regret or merely damp with memory, dunked over and over in it till the tea grows tepid, is drunk, and the guests full go home. But you're still here, left to clean up. And then uh, this last one. Uh, thanks so much to Kyle and Joan for having me. Uh, and thanks to Eric and Joseph and uh, Hannah for being here. So Hannah or Hannah? I think we determined it was Hannah. Thank you so much for being here. Is it Hannah? Okay. <laughs> so this is a, this one's even super shorter. Uh, and this was for, uh, I wrote this at first Thursday, uh, September 7, 2017. This was at the IU Arts Plaza at first Thursday four years ago already so <clears throat> this is called maximum dog this is for a dog lover maximum dog oh you butt to mutt of tongue and sausage gut wallowing on couches and impossible to make do anything unridiculous or properly dog-like more old man stink than puff of pup and only once were you ever told no because it just doesn't matter now does it Thanks. I believe Joseph is next. Thank you, Tony, and thank you, Joan and Eric and Hannah and Kyle. Thanks for having me. I was 
uh, honored to to take part in this. So this last one's going to be again out of uh, my newest collection, Snout Chasing Tail. This is called The Collective Narrative. In times like these, a man finds himself clinging to clinging to familiar things for comfort. The economy isn't a crapper. There's a worldwide pandemic tearing to, through the streets. And when I sit down to write, I just end up staring at this blank page. There are things to be said, damn it. Yet here I sit, pondering my dedication to the word, second guessing my resolve to do more than exist, to be more than a cog in the machine, to add a page, a chapter, dare I say an entire book to the collective narrative of humanity. Thank you, that's all I got. Thanks for having me. Um, Eric, you're next. That was great. Uh, thank you, Joseph. And uh, I've had a wonderful time this evening uh, reading with you and Tony. And Joan, you've been the hostess with the mostess. And Hannah, your music is is wonderful. I, I'm going to, I've been really tidy about time tonight, I think. So I just want to add, in addition to this poem, I just want to say, I've loved this series. It's been one of the things that's kind of uplifted me throughout the whole uh, COVID experience because there's something about it always works in kind of unexpected ways. The the poems and the music start speaking to one another and it uh, becomes this uh, kind of beautiful exchange that uh, is uh, Zooming and Facebooking around. So anyways, I've, I'm really happy to be here again. And I'm gonna close with this poem. First glance at a new day. Full moon poised over the Western line. Stars bright enough to resist being hidden by its splendor, burn their congratulations forward into the dark. A small, slow moving set of lights low just above the horizon is some aircraft up early on its way, or maybe the opposite, out late, nearing the end of an overnight flight, and there on the earth, running along the road through the trees, headlights of a car, moon, stars, aircraft, car, everything has its direction its set journey, and it feels like all movement is perfect. Thank you. Um, that was wonderful. Just everything has been just fantastic tonight. So we're going to close um, with another musical set with Han Hannah and um, and then we'll come back for a few closing remarks. Thank you all for coming. And Hannah. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm so glad Kyle reached out to me a few months ago about this. Um, and uh, I guess it wasn't mentioned in my bio, but I did attend Indiana University. I graduated in 2019 and I've lived in New York um, ever since then. Um, I played a few of the songs I played earlier. I will also be playing with my band Tide Pools when we're at the Block House on October 13th. Um, so mark your calendars for that. We're super excited. I always love um, coming back to Bloomington. It's a very, very special place in my heart. Um, I'm going to play a short rendition of Jerome Kern's All the Things You Are. And I just saw, oh yes, and Kyle, Kyle gave a shout out. I'm, I'm also from Des Moines, which I can't remember, Kyle, if you're also from there or if your parents are there, but we've got some good- I grew up in suburbia, yeah, but yeah, the Des Moines area. Some good Midwest energy. Um, this is all the things you are.
Thank you. Well, thank you to everybody. It's a wonderful evening. Um, so a reminder again, that Hannah will be at the Block House with her band on October 13th. And next month, we will be back here on Zoom. Uh, October is National Hispanic Heritage Month. And so we're having our spoken word series on Wednesday, October 6th at 6 p.m. And it'll be Zilia belkonski Sayas, Shauna Ritter, and Rosebud Banoni. And uh, we're still... Uh, still determining the music so um, please stay tuned watch the newsletter watch the website and if people want to hang out for a little while on zoom and chat that's great if you have things you need to do we understand um thank you so much for coming and have a pleasant evening all of you <laughs> tony <laughs> and it uh, happens Yes, and Julie Newmar also. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to stop the stream now and uh, we can hang out. Okay.